Cool. Okay. So I'm going to give a quick introduction to myself and my background and then get into the crux of what this talk's about, which is all about pitching for investment. Um, arguably, raising investment is one of the hardest things in the world to do. You're literally selling um, a dream and in return, you're just getting a piece of paper. Uh, someone's getting a piece of paper. Um, so quick introduction to me. So I started a company called Alpaca, which was a social network for travel blogging. Shortly after that, I had breakfast with Sir Richard Branson. Um, we launched the platform all over Europe. Uh, one of my team members was the founder of Yik Yak, which was a social network worth $400 million after one year, and they raised $73 million in funding. Um, so I had a brilliant team, learned everything I knew uh, from working with them. And we launched all over uh, Southeast Asia. I had a TV interview with Piers Linney. And uh, this is where the story gets a bit crazy because after we launched across Southeast Asia, uh, one of our main investors uh, dropped out last minute. So he's meant to invest a quarter of a million pounds and he never did, which meant myself and my team, our bank account hit zero and I could hardly afford to pay them. So I went $30,000 in personal debt to keep paying uh, their wage. Um, and this is where it gets really tricky. And this is where I learned most of my, my knowledge. Uh, but then I took out a credit card and I used that to fly to Silicon Valley. Uh, in Silicon Valley, I was living in a garage with other entrepreneurs. Uh, this guy just here, he was originally from India. At the age of 18, he moved to Silicon Valley and he joined Y Combinator. Shortly after that, he raised about three or four million. Um, so yeah, there's about, I think, 15 of us in this house, um, all tech entrepreneurs. Uh, so learned a lot from those guys. And when I was in Silicon Valley, I wanted to network with the top people as quick as possible. So I went onto the street. This is about five minutes from Facebook, Google, and where Mark Zuckerberg lives. And I held this sign saying we were raising investment. Um, and this, this photo actually went a bit viral over there. And I ended up having meeting after meeting after meeting. I also pitched in front of the Sand Hill Angels. These are the most notorious angel investment group in the world. Uh, so I'm standing right there. That's where you know, the guys who set up Uber, Airbnb, I and mean, all these successful companies will have pitched uh, in front of these guys at some point along their journey. Um, I also met some incredible people. So for example, Rich Page, who's one of the guys who set up Apple with Steve Jobs. Um, and I also started to network with some of the top VCs um, and investors in the world. Um, unfortunately, with COVID being in the travel industry, um, Alpaca came to an end after four years last year. Um, but on sort of the, the last uh, year or two of Alpaca, I started lecturing universities on how to raise investment, um, lecturing for accelerator programs, mentoring, um, I think over 50 entrepreneurs in the last year or two, and helping them raise anything from pre-seed to series A. I've also worked on deal flow with some of the biggest VCs in the world, so helping them um, with introductions to entrepreneurs and also helping them uh, introductions to LPs as well, who are the limited partners who invest uh, in VCs. Um, so General Catalyst, very good friends with those guys. Um, they're the sixth largest VC in the world. Uh, Sequoia, I'm sure most of you heard of, worked with those guys as well. Um, and a very good story of mine is last year, I was giving a lecture to Aberystwyth University, to entrepreneurs who are about to graduate. And one of those guys, he founded a company called Revolancer. Um, so I helped him out one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentorship for about a month or two, um, just like an hour call every week. Um, and he opened his round last year and he closed it within about a week, I think. He raised 150K pre-seed uh, and he's VC backed as well. Um, so, so yeah, it's always great to give back. And that's the reason why I'm giving this call is to tell people the secrets of what I learned past, over the past four years um from what i was doing and also working with people who have raised tens of millions um in anywhere from silicon valley to london so i'm going to give you a quick introduction to what that looks like how it works um tactics and strategies to make that more successful so when any of you guys go to raise your round um, you'll do it much more smoothly hopefully and you can maximize how much you raise maximize your valuation and, and other, thing, other things as well um, so after Alpaca ended, I joined uh, Entrepreneur First, which is one of the top um, pre-seed accelerators in the world. So I started that last year in London. 
Uh, that's that's backed by Reid Hoffman, the guy who uh, founded PayPal and LinkedIn. Two of their portfolio companies are Tractable, which is worth over a billion, and Magic Pony, which after a year was acquired by Twitter for 150 million. So I've been in that program for about six months now, which is uh, phenomenal. Um, and that's just coming to an end now. Uh, the company I'm starting now is called Timestake, which is a NFT marketplace um, connecting digital celebrities with their fan base. Uh, so that's going to launch in the next few months as well. So that's a super quick introduction to myself. Um, and now I'll get on to the crux of uh, what this talk is all about. Um, again, at the end, any questions, um, we'll have a discussion at the end. Um, so write them down or, or remember them for, for afterwards. Cool. Okay. So when, um, when I talk to people about raising investment, a lot of people instantly want to know where do they find investors? So this talk is going to go through all the stages. So the, the stage before you even need to think about talking to investors, right through, through to actually closing the round, um, getting the money in the bank. Um, so we're going to go through the three stages. So the prep stage, the pitching stage, and then the closing stage. So even before, okay, so before I get onto, onto the actual content, um, this took me a lot, about three years to understand fully. Um, so I'm going to give you, this, you guys this information now, uh, just because this is super useful. So when you're raising investment, there are different stages. So the early stage, pre-seed, um, could be anywhere from you know, a couple hundred thousand, um, sometimes much, much larger. Uh, and then you've got seed stage, which is you know about half a million to maybe four million, uh, and then series A, B, C, and it keeps going. It could go to G or F um, right up until IPO. So the percentage of startups which get to this late stage are almost close to zero. Not many do. This is where sort of Airbnb, Uber got to. Most companies get to about seed or series A. Um, obviously, most um, well percentage-wise get to there, um, but in terms of numbers, obviously most don't get past pre-seed. Um, or, or two seed. Um, so this lecture content should hopefully allow you to smash this early stage, so particularly pre-seed and seed, um, and also then series A. Um, so these rounds are basically, it's more of a marketing talk, um, but it's for what stage you're at. So the pre-seed is when literally you have an idea, and you want to explore it, you need some capital behind you to, to, to basically explore the idea. Um, once you've proven traction, and there's something, um, you know, secure in place, which shows the projection of where you're going to go in the future. So it could be you've started to achieve sales, could be you've created um, a working MVP. Um, it could be anything which is, you know, you've got something a bit more than just an idea, basically. And um, then you can raise seed. And that money is basically used to hopefully get, um, you know, for you to get profitable or to get to a stage where, um, you know, you can rescale it globally. I and mean, at that point, you raise series A. Um, and this is when you really go massive um, and start the scale up stage. Uh, and after that, the rounds just get easier and easier as you get bigger and bigger. Um, but these are the main three stages. So it's just important to understand what they are. Um, so if you've just got an idea, you know, you're at pre-seed, um, you know, seed can be split into sometimes three. That's quite common now in the UK. So people raise like an early seed of a couple hundred thousand. Then they raise, you know, a later seed of, you know, maybe five million, seven million. Um, and each location is different as well. So Silicon Valley, obviously, they have massively inflated valuations. Um, London is obviously relatively inflated for European standards. Um, and obviously, Wales is actually, uh, I think a report came out the other day, which I saw on LinkedIn, which is Wales is uh, the worst place in the UK for valuations, um, which is annoying. Um, but I'm going to hopefully give you some tips and tricks to uh, get around that and make sure that you are raising um, the right amount. Um, so obviously, this is split into two types of investors. You have um, angels, or at the start, it could be what's called friends, family, and fools. Um, so this could be, you know, a rich uncle giving you 10,000. It could be a family friend giving you 5,000. And then your angels who are either, you've got, well, the different types of angels, but you've got super angels, um, which is the best way to think about that is, or dragon's den, you know, people who've made significant amounts of money in, in entrepreneurship or other areas um, and they want to you know, invest back into startups um, or you've got sort of a, what's now called like the uh, I don't know, a middle class kind of angel you know someone with a lot of savings who wants to invest in startups could be you know a high paid lawyer could be 
accountant, could be literally anybody, an angel could be anybody um, who has you know the capital to invest. I think the average check size for angels ranges from 10 to 20K in the UK. Um, and then you get to VCs. So not many VCs invest at pre-seed, but quite a few get in a seed. Uh, most start investing at series A. So a VC is an investment institution. So they raise money from pension schemes, from super angels, from businesses, uh, and then they use that money to invest. Um, and then after 10 years, they give it back to um, their initial investors and they keep a percentage of uh, what they what they made on the return of investment. Um, so it's important to know the difference because each one you can you pitch differently to um, and they have different motives and incentives behind the reason um, what, why they invest and also what they want to get out of the investment. Um, so it's really important to understand who these people are, what stages they invest at, um, and then what stage you're at as well. One important thing to note is the dilution. So um, the rule of thumb is by series C, so after B, C, um, the founding's team need to have at least, or well, that's the, when they go below 50%. So this is really important to note down. So you imagine, obviously, if you raise pre-seed and you dilute by 10% and then seed at 20% and then series A at 20%. So basically, by the time you get to series C, that's when the founding team needs to have less. That's when it's okay to go below the 50% mark. Um, but until then, you need to be very careful with your equity. You know, I think Dragon's Den is a really bad um, example of what the real world is like because you know they, they invest 20k and they get 50 percent or something ridiculous uh, the real world is not like that um so you need to be careful you know you don't give away 40 percent here um or 30 percent here you need to make sure by the time you get later on you have enough and that's important for two reasons one for you and your founding teams have motivation to carry on um two because vcs don't actually invest in entrepreneurs when there's, they've been diluted massively. So it's actually really annoying because you could have an angel here who's very harsh on equity and they say, you know, nope, you're going to be valued at 1 million pounds and you're going to be diluted by 40%. Well, that actually means they're probably going to lose their money because by the time you get to a later round, um, in VCs won't invest because you've been diluted too much already. So actually it's beneficial for these guys to not take that much equity and for your valuation to actually be higher. Um, but not too high, obviously, but, uh, you know, a good enough level. Um, so they're just some basic rules, which took me a while to understand to get my head around. Um, but they're critical for you planning um, this strategy, basically, of how you get from your idea um, to how you grow it to be, you know, a super successful company. Um, obviously, most companies raise C in the Series A. They don't need to raise any more money. Um, they're fine. They've, you know, you've got a team of 100 or 200 or 50. Um, you're scaling nicely. Um that's completely fine. Um, but obviously this strategy you need to have in your head um, just to make sure you do everything right from the start because a lot of the decisions you make are irreversible. Cool. So before we even get into talking to investors, um, the stage before that is all about the prep. So all you're doing in this stage is two things, building and selling. Um, selling, you might not have a product yet, but you still need to basically do two things um, in this process. One is prove the problem space. So you need to prove the size and potential of this opportunity. Um, and the second thing you need to do is to fully de-risk it for investors. So if you think about it from their point of view, they wanna make sure you can acquire users cheaply, that you can achieve a certain amount of um, revenue from each user or customer. Um, they wanna prove that you maybe you have virality. They wanna prove that you have product market fit. So you need to continually de-risk it for the investor. And the more you do that, the more um, basically high valuation can be and the more um, your professional investors will be interested. So especially VCs. Um, so this early stage, all you need to be doing is building and selling, building and selling um, without even thinking about, you know, pitching uh, at the very start. Um, also, you can only do this to a certain extent before you actually need to raise investment to, to move forward. Um, and also it's quite hard at pre-seed you might need capital in the bank in order to just take one step forward. Um, but there are little things you can do just to move forward quickly. Um, a big one is a lot of people I lecture to, you know, they want to create a platform or a mobile app. Um, you know, that could cost 100, 200 grand easily. So, but there are things you can do in the short term in terms of the UI, the UX, the design, 
just little things and um, beta signups, um, you know, have a waiting list. Um, you know, if you get like 500,000 users signing up, that's obviously showing traction. So even with when you need capital to get started, there are things you can do before um, you begin to raise investment. So this is an important phase, which a lot of people um, don't do correctly, which will obviously makes means that they don't have a, a good strategy in place to, to, to raise the, the round they want to raise. Um, and this is, I've actually had this mistake massively with my startups as well. Um, the next most important thing is getting a strong team behind you. Um, arguably that is one of the most important things that uh, an investor, a professional investor um, with you know, VCs uh, look into. You know, you could have, you know, the best idea in the world, but if you don't have the right team to pull it off, you're not going to pull it off. So you need to make sure you have an exceptional team around you and able to do that. So usually that involves obviously co-founders. So, you know, usually two or three. Um, investors like to see a few co-founders. Sometimes you are just a sole founder, which is fine, um, but it does obviously make it easier when there's two or three heads together rather than just one. As well as the founding team, also you have your first hires. Um, so basically you want to mold your team um, to make sure you have the skills to pull this off. Um, so the classic Silicon Valley trio is um, the hacker, someone who can build, um, the hustler, who's usually, um, you know, obviously hustling, getting sales, um, and the visionary as well. Sometimes the latter two are, are together, so there's the CEO and the CTO. Um, but essentially, you want to build a very strong team around you. Um, and then as well, an easy way to add value on top of that is to gain a very good board of advisors, or um, even further than that, non-exec directors. Um, so these guys are people who are not obviously full-time in the company, but they do commit you know, an hour a month or an hour a week or something. Um, and you give them a little bit of equity. Um, and usually they wanna do it because they enjoy um, helping you um, and they enjoy helping startups. And it's quite a you know, sexy thing to have on your LinkedIn um, as well. Um, but essentially when you are looking for advisors or NEDs, there's a few things you need to consider. One is the weight of their name. Um, you know, if you've got a very impressive person from an impressive company, you know, that adds value to you. The next is um, the weight of their, their contact list. Like, who do they know? Can they introduce you to the right people, either for investment or for, um, you know, for customers or, or whatever else you're doing? And then the third thing is um, their industry knowledge. You know, if they've been working in um, you know, the banking industry for 10 years, 20 years, you know, that's something you can use if you're you know, a fintech startup or something. So really understanding your, what you're missing out in your team and then filling those gaps um, is great. You know, if you've got you as a CEO and you've got a CTO, um, but, you know, an investor might think, okay, these guys are great, but they don't really have much you know, marketing experience. You could get someone who's been head of marketing for, you know, a very successful company as, as an advisor um, and that could just sort of fill the gap. So these little things are, are useful just to, one, actually help you and two, um, prove to external parties um, that you're capable of pulling things off um, and also validating the idea. You know, if you get some very good advisors and NEDs involved, that's really going to help you out. So, for example, going back to my um, previous uh, slide, when I graduated university, I was just an entrepreneur out of university. You know, I had no experience, literally had no experience doing anything. Uh, but the fact I had the founder of Yik Yak as our non-exec director. And obviously they raised 74 million in funding and they grew their user base to tens of millions. Um, that was like validation that, okay, this guy's on the team. He loves what they're doing. And that just helped us massively um, uh, in terms of the way we were perceived by investors. And also the fact obviously won awards as well, notable people. So these are little things we just name drop what who you've got on your team, what awards you've done. And they sort of add value for when you are uh, raising investment. Um, so yeah, so team, super, super important. So the third thing here is pitch decks. So um, obviously we are taught as a society that you need a business plan. I've never seen anyone raise investment today with a business plan. <laughs> Maybe they did 10, 20 years ago, but not anymore. Um, if you want to raise investment, you need a simple, slick, pitch deck so usually 10 12 i think the average is actually up to 20 slides 
you don't really want any more than sort of 25, 30. Um, but this is really explaining the opportunity for investors. So the usual format is intro slides that really grabs attention, really nice graphics. Then it's the problem statement, the product and solution um, or revenue model. Then it's the market size um, and, and sort of why now. And then competitive landscape, go to market. Um, sometimes you could have exit strategies, sometimes you could have financials, uh, then the team, then the ask. Um, but you can Google pitch decks. You can find some really nice templates. Uh, there are a lot of websites where you can utilize templates and just change things on there. But the pitch deck is super, super important. Um, I usually rip apart about three pitch decks a week uh, for our entrepreneurs who are about to raise their investment round. Um, but yeah, this is super important. So the way it usually works is um, an investor will ask your pitch deck, you'll send it to them if they're interested and they'll want to jump on a call with you. So the pitch deck needs to, I think the average time spent on the pitch deck is three minutes, 40 seconds. So you need to very simply on each slide, really explain the opportunity, get them excited. And the objective of the pitch deck is to get them on a call. When you're on a call, it's to get them to uh, want to invest. And after that, then it's getting them to transfer. So there's a whole sales process. Um, you know, you can't just get money up front straight away. Um, so this, you know, the pitch deck is basically, <laughs> the objective is to get them interested in going on a call. When you're on a call, you can have an extended pitch deck with more slides, um, which you can pitch them about. You can also have a much longer extended pitch deck. Um, you know, if they ask for more information, you can send that over. Um, and that's probably more sort of a business plan um, with you know everything in there that you've researched and, and everything else. Um, so the fourth uh, point I want to talk about is where do you find investors? And this is super hard because um, there aren't there are only a few. Well, any, first of all, with angels, anyone could be an angel. So the biggest advice is when you're raising pre-seed, it's you know you want to look at those friends, family, and fools to get you started. Um, there are really good angel uh, websites. So one is angelinvestmentnetwork.co.uk. Again, that's angelinvestmentnetwork.co.uk. And this is a really good platform. Some of my friends have raised a couple of million on there. Um, we raised, I think maybe 400, 500,000 on there. Um, so it's a really good place to find good angels um, who can add value as well as um, give you, um, you know, checks as well. Um, so, yeah, it's basically like a platform which matches you with investors. You put up a profile of who you are um, and they basically say if they're interested or not. Um, there are others as well, um, like Connected without the E, ED is Connect and D. Um, they're quite a good platform. I know a few people have raised on there. Um, and then obviously VCs. Um, you, you have websites for VCs. There's lists of VCs. You want to find a VC who's in your space and in your um in, in your uh well stage so some investors only do series b onwards others do pre-seed others do series series a um obviously some are concentrated on fintech or healthcare so you want to find um, a list of ones which are in your area um there are professional introducers who introduce you to vcs um i do this quite a lot as well um and then you also have um there's quite a bit of support in, in the Welsh government and Tech Nation on introductions to VCs. I think Tech Nation's got a very good way of doing it. Um, so that's worth doing as well. Um, so that's a quick introduction to where to find investors. And um, one thing which is hard is, especially with angels, is reaching out on places like LinkedIn and asking for investment. Because the rule of thumb is if you ask for investment, you get advice. And if you ask for advice, you get investment. So, you know, it, the whole investment game is that you're not going there asking straight up for investment. Um, it's very much building that relationship up when it's an angel investor. If it's a VC, then obviously it's appropriate for you to actually ask, um, you know, given the pitch deck um, up front. Um, so each one does it differently. And um, one thing to note on that is investors don't sign um, NEDs. Um, sorry, not NEDs, NDAs. Uh, that's because especially VCs, they get hundreds, if not that, well, thousands, if not tens of thousands of pitch decks every year. Um, they've probably seen opportunities similar to yours. So yeah, investors generally don't sign NDAs. 
um, unless there's something which is critical, which, you know, for example, um, you know, you're in biomedical something or other, and there's some secret source to what you're doing. Um, but again, the investor probably doesn't need to know the insides out of that anyway. Um, so generally they're not needed. It just creates more hassle and, and non, and, you know, it starts off the relationship being not trustworthy. So I'd advise um, you know, not to do that. Okay, the next one is understanding investors, what investors are looking for. Um, so we'll see the two types of investors. Angel investors, when they invest, it's usually around, uh, it's, it's an emotional investment. They want to, they, they love you, they love what you're doing, they love the product, they want to see you change the world. And they basically fall in love with the idea of what you're doing. Um, and you're selling this, this vision of what the future is going to look like. So it's very much an emotional investment for angel investors. Um, obviously, it, it is financial as well, but it's not strictly um, the same as with VCs. Obviously, with VCs, they want to see that there's a big opportunity, the world's changing, and you are the key to unlock that change. Um, and this is what the future is going to look like. Um, obviously, not everyone agrees with that, which is great. You know, when Uber launched or Airbnb, a lot of people didn't think that, you know, having someone random stay in your house, that wasn't a viable you know, business opportunity. Um, but the few who did managed to invest in Airbnb, and now it's a billion dollar company. So that's how you pitch it to a VCs, essentially, um, that this is how the world's going to change and you are the key to changing it um, because you've got the best team, because you've got the best strategy and you've got the best product. Um, you, know, you are the best thing to create this, this future reality. Um, but obviously, they want a return on their investment. So they want to see that this opportunity is growing. You know, this problem space is growing. It's urgent. It's going to be mandatory for this, to, you know, this problem to be solved. Um, so they want to see that change um, and basically why you're the reason to unlock it. So I agree this is the what the talks um, bulk of it is meant to be on is the actual pitching. Um, so I'll talk to you about that now. So when you are pitching for investment, the most powerful tool you have is storytelling. So if you think back to the start of time, for humanity, you know, even then we had stories, you know, you had paintings on the walls in, in caves um, and throughout history, we always tell stories. So storytelling is super important. It's what gets investors excited on what this future is going to look like. Um, so the way you pitch and how you pitch it and the emotion that you create for investors is super important, um, you know, in getting them excited for uh, investing in, in, in whatever you're doing. Um, a big thing then is what I call what are called DHVs, which are demonstrations of higher value. Um, so this is a little little hints you can drop in um, to make yourself seem and an R to be much better than um, you are, if that makes sense. So for example, with um, Alpaca, you know, I didn't just go to investors and I was like, I've, I'm a graduate, I have no work experience, but I want to start this company. Can you give me, you know, three hundred thousand? Um, it's very much like um, we won an award backed by Sir Richard Branson. Tyler draws our non-exec. He was CEO of a company with 400 million after one year. So you're demonstrating higher value um, by name dropping successful people who are involved, maybe name dropping su uh, success, traction. You know, you've got 5,000 signups already. Um, so it's little, little hint, bits of gold dust, basically. So you imagine your startup is just a pile of mud, which most startups are. But within that, you've got this gold dust. You want to basically collect that gold dust and show it to investors in a simple way for them to go, wow, you guys are great. So demonstrations of higher value are super important. Um, so you just have to understand what that could look like. So it could be awards you've won. It could be amazing team members, advisors. It could be you know, traction, um, anything which basically puts you on a pedestal from you know to make people perceive you in a much better way. Um, the third thing is creating FOMO. This is super important. So if we go back to this early stage, this stage here, like pre-seed, seed series A, this is, it's not really about um, numbers because you never have the numbers at this stage. After series B, that's when it's on like, okay, this is the revenue. This is how great you are um, on, on your Excel spreadsheet. Um, but before that, it's all about the hype and the fear of missing out and creating that FOMO. Um, and this is super, super important 
because when most people I know go to raise investment, they don't pitch it in the right way. Um, so for example, and this goes on to then the, the, the reverse pitch as well, but for example, you know, people go to investors and they're like, basically without saying these words, they're basically, you know, please invest in, in me. Um, but the actual way to do it is, you know, hello investor. Um, you're great, but then we've got all these other investors who are interested. You know, what kind of value can you add to us additional to capital? Like what, why should we choose you as an investor? Uh, and this reverse pitching is super important. Um, and actually with Alpaca, my previous startup, um, we raised a lot of our capital from investors who weren't that interested, I felt like during the pitch. And at the end, I reverse pitched it and I made them pitch to me. And I literally said, you know, we've got loads of other investors. Why should we choose you as an investor? And then for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, they were pitching themselves to me how amazing they are. Um, and then at the end, they were like, look, I want, I want in. They'll put me down for 20K. So reverse pitching is super important, um, not only for creating the fear of missing out, but also for creating um, or validating that they are a real investor. You know, there are a lot of angel investors who don't actually invest very much. There are a lot of VC funds who haven't actually raised their round yet. Um, or, you know, it, you need to basically make sure that who you're pitching to, they actually have the money um, to invest. So easy questions you can ask for that is, What's your usual check size? So how much do they usually invest? Um, who have you invested in recently? How many startups have you invested in? Um, maybe if it's a VC, it could be because they have like 10 year funds, they usually invest it within the first three years. So, you know, when did the fund start? How, how long has it gone until it closes? So understanding ask these questions um, allows you to vet the investor because the last thing you want to do when you're raising investment is to waste time pitching to someone who's never going to invest. Um, you know, raising investment is super stressful. It's massively time consuming. It's a full-time job on its own, let alone actually running the company as well. So this reverse pitch, you know, asking them, you know, why we should choose them as an investor. Um, and then also asking like more questions on who they are, how much they invest, uh, who have they invested in previously? Is it okay if you talk to, um, you know, other companies they've invested in, in their portfolio? Um, and if they come up with some strange things like, oh, all of our companies are under NDA, or, you know, usually they're just messing you around. Um, and yeah, you just want to avoid those situations because there are a lot of sharks in the sort of investment world. Uh, the fifth one is uh, an interesting one, which is there's three types of no. So as you can imagine, when you're pitching for investment, there are a lot of no's. Sometimes there are, uh, you know, you could get a hundred no's then one yes. So understanding the three types of no is super important. So the first one is no straight up. Um, it's not, I'm not interested. It's not something I want to invest in. That's fine. The next one is no, I don't get it. So that means your pitch is a little bit confusing. You need to simplify it down or you need to simplify your strategy to make people understand it. Um, this is particularly the case when an idea is, you know, a bit, uh, you know, it could be blockchain or it could be, something crazy with healthcare or bioscience um you know when you've got a lot of jargon in there or it's really hard to understand um what you're actually doing because it is a complicated space that's when you really need to simplify it down for investors because they're not usually industry experts so you need to simplify it in a way which you know anyone like you know your, your grandparents could understand basically or a, or a five-year-old could understand and the final type of no is no not yet um because you know we want to see a little bit more traction so you need to understand why it's a no. So you could, it's okay to ask, you know, thank you for your time investor. Um, you know, appreciate the call. Just want to understand like why, um, you know, you decide why, why is it a no? What's, what's the main reason? Is there anything we can change which will make you say yes? So understanding, it might be, you know, we didn't think there's a good go to market strategy. Then you need to go away and think, right, okay, we need to improve that part of the pitch potentially. So understanding why it's a no is important. And most invest most entrepreneurs I know at the start of their round, they'll pitch to investors they don't want to receive investment from necessarily. And that's just to practice the pitch and understand uh, how they can improve it before they go to the investors they actually want. So now this could be tweaking slides, could be changing your strategy, uh, but understanding those three types of no's is super important. And also don't take it personally um, because you know you will receive no's and it's really hard, it's really easy to um, 
be connected to that and you know have a negative perspective of that investor because they said no but you don't want to burn that bridge you want to keep that that connection there uh, because you never know they might invest in the future they might introduce you to people who can invest um, and that's actually an important point when you get an investor who has uh, committed to invest uh, the easiest way to get more investors is to ask them, you know, is there anyone in your network? Can you give me three people in your network who, um, you know, you think would want to invest in us as well? Um, and is that, I don't know what the percentage is, it, percentage is, but it's actually a really likelihood that someone they introduce you to will actually end up investing, um, which is great. Um, and that's because obviously if a friend of yours who, you know, you trust invests in something, um, you're more likely to invest rather than it being a completely random startup you're investing in on your own. Um, so using that sort of little networking effect with uh, existing investors is super important. Um, the last thing then is grit. You know, I know a lot of entrepreneurs who've given up halfway through investment round. Um, again, raising investment is one of the hardest things to do. So just having that grit persistence to adapt and change um, will get you from when you first start pitching to when you actually close and the money is in the bank. So usually the process is um, there's some sort of early communication with an investor. You get them excited to jump on a call with you. Once you're on a call with them, then you're basically pitching everything. Then they're asking questions. And then finally, like the last, last 15 minutes, maybe you're asking them questions, they're pitching to you. Um, and then basically, basically, maybe a few days later, um, you know, they follow up or you follow up um, and maybe there's a secondary call. Um, but eventually you want to make sure quite quickly, whether they're in or out, you don't want them to mess you around for a month, six months. You want to make sure, you know, the money comes into the bank. So you want them to say, you know, um, there's little things you can do to hurry that up as well. It could be, you know, we're closing the round in the next few months or you follow up and say that we've had three more investors join this morning. Um, we've now closed 50 percent of our round. So you want to make sure that you are moving quickly on um, creating that hype and that fear of missing out that they need to invest straight away. Um, unfortunately, the reality of the situation is investors are like sheep. And um, in the bigger rounds, when you've got you know, VCs, you'll usually have a lead investor. So they'll commit maybe 30 or 50 percent of the round. And then you'll keep getting smaller investors to put in smaller amounts among that. Or it could be just a whole party round where everyone's just putting in, you know, 10, 20, 30K. Um, but the aim is to move quickly with that. Um, unfortunately, the situation is investors generally won't invest um, in that party round if they haven't already got investors secured. So if you go to them without saying you, know, you don't have any investors interested, then that's like a, a red flag in their head. So the way to get around that is saying, We've only opened the round this week. We have got um, 10 investors um, interested um, so you, or, or committed. So you don't need to say it's in the bank. But if you say, you know, you've got a lot of interest, you've got pitched to a lot of investors. And that just gives them, um, you know, peace of mind that there are, you know, it's not just them going to invest. You've got loads of other people invested. And again, it leads to create that, that fear of missing out. Um, so that's super important. Um, and usually once you've raised at least 30%, then it gets much easier um, and after 50 percent the rest it comes in like you know maybe a few days or a few weeks uh, so the whole process from first starting to pitch to closing on average takes three months so roughly the first month is pitching uh, the second month is um, sort of signing documents due diligence um, and then finally the last month is closing getting it in the bank um, but you want to make sure that you know people are moving along that cycle. They're not just stuck in the interested phase. You want to keep following up. You know, every I usually do every like three or four days, um, just saying if they've got any questions, or I give them a hint of good news. Again, a demonstration of high value. You know, we just had another investor. Um, this this amazing investor from this company just put in X amount. Um, so just again, creating that fear of, my, fear of missing out, demonstration of high value, it's adding to the story. You know, if you start pitching to them two months ago and within that time you've had this all this success, that's part of the storytelling as well. Um, so, so yeah, I could talk about all these little strategies for hours and hours, but I'm conscious we've only got 15 minutes left. Um, so I'm going to briefly 
talk to you about these other points, and then we could open up to any questions. So overall, if any of you are from marketing, you know, ABCs always be closing. Um, again, the initial stage is to get them interested on a call. Then it's to get them to um, either on another call or to commit. Um, and then it's to actually get documents signed. Then it's to get it in the bank. So you want to keep moving them along this process. You know, you can't go in at the start asking them to sign and transfer. There is a process of getting them interested and then leading up nicely to transferring in the bank. Um, how much to raise? Again, this depends on where you are on the timeline. Um, also depends on your industry. So it's really hard to say um, an exact amount, but basically um, you want to raise enough to get you to the next stage. So pre-seed, you want to raise, raise enough that you can prove traction to raise your seed. When you raise your seed, you want to raise enough that will get you to where you're at a good point to raise your series A. Um, but again, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, but the best thing to do is to look at what other companies in your location, um, you know, in the UK, for example, are raising or what in your industry are raising um, as well. And uh, then timelines. So usually it's uh, six months overall. So three months prep, then it's three months of start pitching in the bank. That could easily be extended to a year, sometimes two years. It, it really depends on if you've raised it before and if you know, you know some of these strategies I've talked about today, that can really get the timeline down. So, yeah, I, yeah. You basically, you don't want to raise when you, you know you need, you've only got a month runway left. You want to make sure there's enough timeline there for you to start prepping. You know, you're building, you're selling, you're building your team, um, you're getting the documents like the pitch deck ready. Then it's you start pitching. Then it's um, you know, getting them interested, get them to sign documents. Then it's a transfer. So this takes quite a bit of time. And the last thing then, uh, I did talk about uh, valuations before. Oh, no, I didn't. Um, so valuations, you have, there's two valuations. The only one which is really important is pre-money. So let's say you're valued at 2 million and then you raise uh, 200,000. So the, the pre-money valuation is 2 million. The post-money valuation is 2.2 million. So depend, you could easily raise more. You, know, you can have more investors join, then your post-money value changes. So your pre-money one is the one which stays uh, the same. Um, you can give discounts to investors. So it could be, you know, if you really want investors to join or, you know, you've only just opened the round and you want to get that up to 30% quite quickly, you know, you can offer investors, you know, if you invest in the next two weeks, you know, you'll get 10% um, discount, 20% discount. Or because, uh, Mr. Investor, you are super successful in this area, we really want you as an investor, that we want to give you 10% discount. These are little things just to help make the opportunity more attractive, um, which are good tactics um, you can use as well. Um, the only downside to that is other investors will want discounts as well, but you can just say that they will want first to join or you know, they, they're, in, they're in advising our company, so they got a little bit of discount on uh, their investment. Um, anyway, so there's just over 10 minutes left, um, so we can go to questions. Um, Thanks, Dan. Anyone want to come off microphone and ask Dan some questions while he's here? Um, yes, um, I have a question, so can I go first? I'm Alexis. Yes, Alexis, carry on. Yeah, um, so Dan, um, I'm not sure if this is a good question to ask, but I currently have uh, this problem. Like, for example, um, I do have an investor right now, like they are investing the company. But do you ever encounter a problem that... Um, when the investor starting to interfere with the decision you make for the company, for example, um, yeah, how do you actually protect yourself from from this kind of situation? You have your own vision, and then your investor starting to um, interfere with the decision because he thinks that he can um, he can make a better decision, and then yeah. it started to have like the conflict. And how can you actually like protect yourself from this one? Yep. Um, so that's actually a big red flag. So um, usually, also when you're talking to an investor, that's a big red flag when they're trying to control everything. Um, so yeah, my advice would be, you can always say no. So if you feel like an investor is basically controlling you and they want to push you in a certain direction, that's the wrong kind of investor. You want an investor who's going to you know, boost you up, um, add massive value to what you're doing. They have to believe in you. This is your company, your idea. So they're always trying to control you. That's not the right kind of investor you want. 
Um, obviously, it's great if they give their opinion, um, but at the end of the day, as CEO, it's your decision to make. Um, it's great to surround yourself by great advisors from different areas, but at the end of the day, it's your decision. Um, so either don't allow them to invest, turn their investment down, say you don't think, you know, um, culturally there's a good fit, um, you, you're looking for a different type of investor. Um, if they have already invested, that can be a problem, obviously. Um, but I think you just need to put your foot down and say, look, um, this is the reason why we're making this decision. And this is for these reasons. Um, we understand, I understand your point of view, but as CEO, look, this is the direction we're taking. So I think it's just being firm um, with them and making sure they don't control you because uh, that's the worst situation you can have. Cool. Uh, yeah, thank you. Dan, I've got a quick, sorry. Sorry, Alexis. I've got a quick question. I put it in the in the chat. Um, how do you avoid piecemeal rounds so that you're not constantly raising? Yeah, well, I've been in that situation before. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I guess it's just getting your idea on that strategy um, at the start. So you're not constantly raising 20, 50K. It's like, right, we're going to raise a significant round. Um, we're going to get a strong lead investor. Um, and also, but before that, obviously, you need to get the right kind of traction in place to do that. So that is, is a really easy trap to fall, in, put, fall into, which I've fallen in, which loads of my good friends have fallen in. Um, but yeah, and it's probably a big problem in Wales because obviously there's not easy access to VCs as there are in other areas. Um, so you're relying on these small checks from angels. Um, so my big advice would be to basically just get the strategy in place, plan it out, make sure you have, you need X amount of, uh, X amount of traction. Um, and to get to the next stage after that, you need to raise this amount of money. And it's just doing the whole process properly and then getting a strong lead investor to invest. Um, but yeah, you can use it for the board. Fab. So I guess what you're saying there is leave it as long as possible before you need to raise and then find one that will probably put a small amount in to begin with, but has the potential to follow on then thereafter. Um, not necessarily. It's more instead of just urgently raising, keep going. It's mm. more like planning out properly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Waiting as long as possible. Yeah, not, maybe not. Uh, I wouldn't use the words waiting as long as possible. It's more getting to the strongest point possible where you can raise. Yeah. Much and then really having that strategy on like how much I need to raise. Um, yeah, it's an easy trap to fall into, and especially for Welsh startups. Um, can I just add to that question? Sorry, we're in um, part of our high street workers brought us to Chalky today, so we're in uh, the Lion Pen. No um, so you and I chatted the other day about the challenges, the regional challenges that we face. Um, sort of trying to get up to London, trying to get over. And you, you met, uh, you mentioned your your trip over to the states as well. How does it compare? How do the regional challenges compare to, say, London or over the pond? Um, what do you mean in terms of? Raising. raising in Wales, yeah, raising in Wales compared to raising yeah, elsewhere. I think the is, um, it's sad reality is the perspective, you know. Um, an easy way to think of it is if you're based in Cardiff, uh, you naturally think you're probably better than a startup, which is all the way on Anglesey. And that's exactly what people in London feel like. You know, all the VCs are in London and there's just this random startup in the middle of Wales. Um, so my advice would be try and change that perspective and say, look, we've got team based here, but we're also based in London. Um, you don't need to be based there, but just go there for meetings. Um, but you can easily change that perspective of who you are. Um, and then secondly, it's just expanding your network because obviously your network is your net worth and having a presence in you know, a, a VC hub like London is a good way to um, you know, build up your contacts, your knowledge. So going to networking events, pitching events, um, and just building up your network there because uh, that means you can easily get good introductions to the right places. So they're probably the two things I do, which are relatively easy to do from, um, you know, the, to try and solve that situation. Thank you, Dan. No worry. Can I drop a question in, please? Yeah. So uh, cheers for that anyway. I want to say a, a big thank you first. But my question is, I am a solo founder, but I work with uh, like a tech development team, for example, who are really, really good. 
Um, so I guess what, what's the best way to display that if I'm speaking to someone that's maybe looking to invest? What's the best way to display that they are a team of high value? Uh, they are local to me as well and I work with them daily. So it's not like a, someone I've, I've sort of sent out to the other side of the world kind of thing, but they're not yep. part of the company. Yeah. So for investors, when they see that situation, I had to overcome this situation as well, um, is it's easy to look at it and say, a great founder, but then he's outsourced this work. Um, you know, the, the, these who it's outsourced to, they're not fully involved in the company. They're not looking in the long term. It's just short term. Um, so, yeah, it's hard. Um, what The way I got around that was I brought them in as co-founders. I actually gave them equity. Um, so a software development team teamed up with me. And we sort of basically all formed the company together. Okay. Um, so they still had like small clients as well, but I was the bulk of their work. They were tied in long term with equity. Um, they were building the product for the long term, not just you know month by month, contract by contract. Um, and, you know, and that gives investors peace of mind. Also gives you peace of mind that you know they've got your back. They're with you for the long term. Um, but yeah, it's really easy in that early stage to outsource dev work um, because obviously dev work is hard to find anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, the it's the core of the founding team. CTO is important or at least like having them more involved. So it could be, you know, you do give them some options or, or shares. They're not co-founders, but they are involved in your company. Um, okay. So yeah, you could no, say no. Look, their work is with you, but they do have these small contracts as well with other people, um, but they are tied in with equity. <laughs> so there are little things you can do to change that perspective. Yeah. Okay. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. No worry. Any more Hello. questions? Yep, someone just speak. No, it was just me asking if anyone else had okay. any questions. <laughs> Get them together. Can I actually have one more question? Yes. Um, so you've mentioned um, creating the FOMO um, on mm -hmm. the pitch during the presentation. And you mentioned um, that it would be worth mentioning that we actually have other investors interested. Could we still do that if we don't have them for those investors? I'm going to say yes. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, without telling you, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you, your pitching to loads of people is all about the storytelling. You know, if you're saying you've got all these investors interested, or well, interested could be, you know, grabbing a coffee with them. It could be they're actually about to invest. Um, it could be you just had a few emails. So you just check, it's just a sales pitch, really. So yeah, you can always say, um, yeah, I'm going to say yes without saying yes to that one. But yeah, that's one strategy you can do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cheers. Okay. Anyone else with the last question? Why put the expert in the room with you? I think pretty much covered everything there. I think we've had a couple of late joiners. I'm not sure. Um, the recording will be available if anyone needs to just drop me a line at the AGP. Um, I spent thanks, Dan, for giving up your time today and to everyone for giving up your time to join us. I think the next AGP one is on the 8th of March, which I believe is about making TikToks instead of adverts, apparently. So uh, on that note, thanks, Dan, and thanks, everyone. Great. We have lots of feedback on the, on the chat there. So uh, thanks, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.